Hello, everybody. My name is Ed. I'm from the Rediscovery Centre. Welcome to Let's Talk Science. We are bringing you some really cool science stuff right into your home or into your classroom. We've got people all around the country watching us right now. And if you are at home, please give me a wave so I can see you. And if you're in your classroom, give me a big shout, big cheer. Mm, I can hear some of you, but I can't hear others. Uh, please let us know in the comments if you're logged into YouTube. Tell us where you're from in the country. It's delighted to see so many people coming in already from all around. Wow. Dundalk, Dublin, all over. Claire. Hi, everybody. So look, at, let's get straight into it. The first thing we're going to talk about today are bats. Bats are amazing. I'm a little scared of them, but I don't know much about them. I'm going to bring somebody in who does and is going to tell us all about how great bats are. So I'd like to welcome in Tina from Bat Conservation Ireland. Hello, Tina. Hello, Ed. How are you? Good, thanks. So, Tina, there's children all around the country who want to know all about bats today. So I'm going to hand over to you and you can Excellent. tell us all about it. Okay, I should share my screen. For some reason. Okay, we go to slideshow. Hope everybody can see the slideshow. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about bats in Ireland. And it's going to be a virtual exploration of their acoustic world. So my name is Tina and I work with Bat Conservation Ireland. So there are places across the world, cave systems, where there's millions of bats roosting in them. And when they emerge at night time, it's literally like a cloud of bats. Now, we don't have this sort of density of bats in Ireland, but it would be a wonderful experience to visit these places. Now, bats belong to a group called Shira, and that literally is Latin for hand wing. And that refers to actually how the arm bones and the fingers, which are elongated, actually frame the wing of the bat. And as a consequence, it gives them powered flight. So bats are the only true flying mammal in the world. Now bats are pretty much found all across the planet, apart from the North and the South Poles. And there are over a dozen species of bat. And of course, the concentration where the most species of bat are going to be in the rainforest areas of Brazil and Southeast Asia. But otherwise, you can get bats all across Europe and indeed in Ireland, which we're going to talk about. Now, there are two groups of bats and we divide them in literally by their size. There's a group called the micro and micro means small. So the majority of the micro bats are insect eating bats. And there's about 800 species of these. And these are the species that we have in Ireland. But then there's the mega bats. And these are the big fruit eating bat that you often see in films. They're much bigger than the micro bats. They're, they eat fruit. They're also the bumblebees of the night and they consume nectar by going from flower and helping to pollinate. Some species will eat meat, others are, are uh, fish eating bats. And then of course, there's, a, a, there's three species of vampire bats, but they're only found in South America. Now in Ireland, as I said, we have micro bats. We have nine species of resident bats. And that's resident literally means they're breeding populations on the island. And we have nine species belong to that, but then we have two vagrant uh, bat species. And these are literally accidental uh, species that came over either through a storm event or, or it is something like that. But we're going to talk about the resident bat species and they're all in different types of family groups called Pipistrellas, Myotas, Plecotus. And this literally is putting them into groups because they have similar features that make them common to that family. Now, before we could talk about Ireland's bats, we're going to talk about education because bats are not blind. Bats have actually got very good eyesight. It's just in darkness. It's just not good enough for them to actually catch those small insects that they like to feed on and also allow them to actually orientate. So instead, bats rely on sound. They've evolved to use echolocation. And echolocation is literally where the bats produce these high pitched sounds either in their mouth or through the nose. And because sound goes out in waves, it goes out, hits off an object. And returning echo allows the bat to determine if that object is an insect that can be eaten or an object to be avoided. And once a bat is flying, it's continuously making these echolocation calls and using the echoes to create a sound in their environment. So they're always flying around, avoiding objects, but looking for lots of insects to eat. 
Now, as I said, these are high pitched sounds. So human hearing goes about 20 kilohertz. Children have better hearing than adults. Adults hear about 15 to 18 kilohertz, but children to about 20 kilohertz. But bats echolocate outside this range, above this range. And as a consequence, we can't hear their bats calls. Now, a bat detector is literally a small hand device which has an ultrasonic microphone in the front. It picks up the noise of the bat and converts it down into a sound that we can hear. Now you'll see on the photograph in the middle of the slide is a bat detector, but it has 54.3 on the actual uh, screen. And that's saying that the detector is tuned to 54.3 kilohertz. Okay, so that's kilohertz is how we actually identify uh, the, the sound that the bat is making, what frequency the bat is making it at. So if you look at this, picture uh, in the far right hand corner of the of the slide you'll see that there is a, a an x and y axis along this on the the left hand axis going from zero to 50 to 100 that's the kilohertz and when i said that humans only hear it about 20 kilohertz it's down at the very bottom below this flat call called leisler's call so the little shapes that are shown here in the graph literally shows you the shapes of the different calls that bat, different bat species make. So you've got the lesser Hershey up here on top, up at 110 kilohertz, and just makes this little step call. And then you've got a dog bend, so it has this long sweeping call going through the frequencies. The common pipistrelle has a hockey shaped call, and the lyser's bat is this flat call near the bottom. And as a consequence, each of the bat species sound different. And that's how we can identify them by using the bat detector. So I'm going to play you the wee sound audio clip that has a collage of seven of our nine resident bat species. It's a jumble of noise, but it's really, really interesting that this is how we, we actually identify bats. So enjoy the noise. Sometimes people t say to me that bats make rude calls, but uh, they think they're one absolutely wonderful because they enjoy listening to their own song anyway. Now, the first group of bats we're going to talk about that are found in Ireland is Pipistrellus. So we have the Nautusius Pipistrelle, Soprano Pipistrelle, and Common Pipistrelle. The Soprano Pipistrelle and Common Pipistrelle are the two most common bat species across the island. So if you're out in the evening time walking when it's dusky and you see bats flying up and down along the hedgerows, more than likely it's one of these two species. While the Nautusius pipistrelle is kind of a special bat, it's only found in big lake areas. So it's the main place it's found on the island of Ireland is Loch Ney, which is the largest lake on the island. Um, now, the pipistrelles, they're quite small bats. Bats are small. Uh, the pipistrelles are the smallest of the bats we have. And an adult bat would sit on the end of your thumb. So the body is only about the size of your thumb. So they're very small mammals. They do have long wingspan, and in the hours of darkness, our imagination goes a little bit wild, and we think these are giant uh, mammals altogether, but they're not. They're very small mammals. They're only interested in eating insects, so there's nothing to be afraid of. Now, when it comes to listening to their calls, the pipistrelles sound similar on a bat detector, but they have different frequencies that they come in. So you remember that picture of the bat detector where we had the dial tuned to 54.3 kilohertz? Well, if you tune a call from Pipistrelle and you tune away and then when you hear the really loud part of the call, you look at your dial and if the dial says 38, point, uh, 38 kilohertz, you've got a Nautusius Pipistrelle. If your dial says it's above 50 kilohertz, you've got a Soprano Pipistrelle. While if your dial says around 45 kilohertz, you've got a common Pipistrelle. So by using the sound, we can actually identify the bats. And this is what a Pipistrelle typically sounds like.
So it's quite a nice bubbly sound. Now our next group of bats is the myotis. This is a family of myotis. And we've got the Dobenton's bat, Natteris bat, and Whiskered bat. Now the Natteris and the Whiskered bat are typically found in woodlands or along dense tree lines. They don't really like to go out in the open. They much prefer to be flying in amongst the tree canopy. While the Dobenton's bat is a bat we call the water bat, and it prefers to feed over the surface of water. So if you ever go down to a lake or a river in the evening time and you see a bat continuously flying across the surface of the water, it's a Dobenton's bat. Now these guys are quite difficult to tell apart using a bat detector, not unless you have a lot of skill and you use specialized equipment to look into the call a wee more. So they can sound quite similar as a result, but if you're down by a river and you see a Dobenton's bat, it's very easy to say it's a Dobenton's because you won't be getting natteris and whiskered over the surface of the water flying the way a Dobenton's bat does. But this is what they sound like. Now our next group is um, the brown long-eared bat, Lysler's bat and lesser Hershey bat. Now you see the brown long-eared bat, look at those really, really long ears. And the reason why this chap has got such big ears is because he likes to feed moths. And moths have evolved to actually hear bat hunting calls. So as a consequence, this chap, this, this species of bat doesn't really want to let the moth know that he's around and hunting and looking to feed in lots of moths. So instead what he does, he uses those big ears to listen to the beating wings of the moth and he sneaks up on them. And he does make some echolocation calls, but they're very quiet. And as a result, we call it the whispering bat. Now the Lysers bat, on the other hand, this is our biggest bat, but it's still fit in the palm of your hand because uh, bat, micro bats aren't that big. So the Lysers bat is the biggest bat in Ireland. Um, it emerges quite early in the evening time because it's quite a fast flying uh, bat. So as a consequence, it emerges, flies high in the sky. It can often be seen flying amongst the swifts and the swallows at night time um, or in the evening time before the birds go into bed themselves. As a consequence, its call is slightly slower in rhythm and quite loud on the bat detector. So this is what it sounds like. Now remember, once a bat is flying, he's going to be continuously making these calls. So having a bat detector is really an eye opener or an ear opener to, to an amazing acoustic sound of bats. Now our final resident bat species is the lesser Hershey bat. This is a very special bat. This is our most protected bat species. It's only found in the west of Ireland in County Mayo, Galway, Clare, Cork, Limerick and Kerry with County Clare and County Kerry being the two stronghold uh, population uh, for this particular species. It's called a Hershey bat because it has a Hershey shaped nose leaf and it's through this nose leaf that it produces its echolocation call. Now it has a very different echolocation call in comparison to all the other bats that we've listened to. It's more like a bird warbling, it's literally because of the way it produces a call and the fact that it produces it at 110, 113 kilohertz which is way outside the hearing range. So you definitely need a bat starter to be able to hear this chap. And this is what he sounds like. Now, if you hear that uh, and you're in the west of Ireland, you'll never be able to actually uh, not know that it's a lesser hurtful bat because it's 
very distinctive and no other bat species in Ireland will make that type of call. Now I mentioned we had two vagrant bat species and this is literally bat species that have turned up, they're not resident or breeding in on the island of Ireland, they literally they accidentally came to Ireland either by a storm event or the right feeding in the Irish Sea, landed on a ferry and ended up in the wrong port. So in 2008, a branch bat turned up in County Wicklow, while in 2012, 2013, a greater Hershey bat turned up in County Wexford. And uh, in 2020, another individual turned up in County Wicklow. The chapter turned up in 2012, 2013, um, because it was the first ever greater Hershey bat found in the country, he has this little ring on his wing and it's IRL 001 because a small little wing point was DNA analysis was done and turned out he was from Wales. So if he did ever turn back, went back to Wales, the Welsh bat groups will be able to let us know if they do come across this bat with an Irish ring on it. So the thing about bats, they're nocturnal. So when it comes to actually serving bats, we rely so much on technology. Even to listen to their hunting calls, we use bat detectors. But when we want to actually count the bats as they're coming out at nighttime, we do a lot of filming. And this is one example of filming we use. This is thermal imagery. So thermal imagery picks up the heat signatories of, of, of living organisms. But in relation to this, it's the bats. So you can see these little lovely golden um, blobs of light coming out as they're merging from the actual roost. And this is a roost that I surveyed down in, in County Cork. And it's a soprano pipistrelle roost and literally we use the filling to get a good accurate uh, count of how many bats are roosting in the in the building. This is also some thermal imagery. We have different color palettes to bring up the up the bats. Each surveyor has different colors color schemes they prefer. So this is a, one that was sent to me by Harm and uh, he's a, a bat worker down in County Wexford and he was filming Dobbetton's bats on Johnstown Castle and you can see all the the little bats forming across the river. As I mentioned, Dobbetton's bats skim across the surface of water continuously, munching on emerging caddisfly and stonefly and mayfly. And it's amazing to see, and you can see that in relation to just the heat signatories, the, the warmest part of the body is the actual body of the bat, and that appears white, while the actual um, cooler wings appear black as a, as a consequence. But thermal imagery really allows us to, to look and watch bats without disturbing them. Because in the areas of darkness, we're not going to be able to see this, not unless we have flash, flashlights. Now, another good time that we survey bats is at dawn. So like you're getting up in the morning time, but the bats are going to bed. So they'll sleep during the day so you can have lots of energy to be feeding at night time. So at dawn, especially in a nice warm summer's morning, before the bats go into bed, they'll swarm. And I don't know whether you've ever seen bees swarm, but it's something similar for bats. They're continuously flying around in circles around the point where they're going to enter into the attic space to actually sleep for the day. And they'll do this for about 20, 30 minutes. And it's, it's an amazing sight. So this is a, a film footage of a roost down in County Tipperary of a Leisler's bat roost. And there's about 40 bats roosting in the actual attic space. And you can hear the echolocation calls on the bat detector that, that was beside the camera. And if we didn't have a bat detector, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to hear any of that sound at all. So bat detectors are essential technology for bat uh, surveyors. And where are bats found? Well, bats feed in insects. And um, the pipistrelles will feed on about 3,000 insects in a night, so they have to be continuously looking for good places to feed. But bats are a landscape animal, and that literally means that they're roosting in buildings or bridges or in hollow trees. They emerge at nighttime to roost. They fly along our rivers, our canals, our hedgerows, our tree lines, going to places where they want to, where there's lots of insects, so they can feed and get lots of energy. So like our tree lines and our hedgerows are so important in the landscape. They're the bats roadways to get them to the woodlands, to get them to the lakes so they can feed. And um, so it's very important that we have a really good mix of, of habitats in our landscape. And bats can fly. So the brown long-eared bat will fly, probably fly about two 
kilometers a night uh, from the roost site, while the pipistrelles up to five kilometers, while the lizard's bat can fly to 20, 25 kilometers away to get to good feeding areas. Really, really important that they have good roadways to get them through the landscape. And of course, like all animals, they do have their annual cycle. So bats cycle is determined by whether there's insects available for them to feed. So we're in autumn going into winter. So there's, as you know, it's getting colder. There's going to be less insects about. So there's no point in bats going out to feed at nighttime if there's nothing to feed on. So instead of going to hibernation, and that's literally where they find a nice deep crevice in a stone structure or a bridge or go underground into a cave. And they literally just bring their body temperature down to the temperature of where they're roosting, usually, usually about six degrees. And as a result, they slow their, their heart rate to a couple of beats per minute. They take one breath of air once every 15 minutes. And as a consequence, they can keep their fat reserves to get them through the winter. And then in spring, when the insects start to emerge, the bats will emerge and feed lots, get, them, get their strength up again. And then in the summer months, the females will, will form maternity colonies, which are literally like creches. And um, the females give birth to one baby. And this is the reason why bats are protected. They only have one baby per year. And they, as a mammal, the, the mammy bat will suckle the baby for six to eight weeks on her own milk. And then when the, the baby is adult size, he will go out for his first time to learn how to fly and learn how to hunt insects. Now, more often than not, it's very difficult to see bats. They tuck themselves away. So you kind of see their signs, such as bat droppings, which are very dry little black droppings that crumble on contact. Or you can see their insect remains because they only eat small body parts of the insects, such as moths and butterflies and the beetles, and then discard the wings and the, the wing cases of the beetles on the ground. So if you ever out in the shed and you see all these bits of uh, wings on the ground, more than likely just a bat visiting that shed at nighttime to feed. So that's my, my, uh, my presentation. I hope you've learned about the amazing acoustic world about bats. We do have a website called Learn About Bats and it's, it's for primary schools and it's lots of resources and fun things to do with your classmates and with your family. So do please uh, check that out. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Tina, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I tell you, looking at the comments and the questions coming in, I think all the kids in the classrooms and at home really enjoyed it as well. Uh, so many interesting things about bats. They are just so cool, aren't they? They are. It's the yeah. only reason I'm in this job. And I've been really for about 20 years and I learn something new every time I go out to survey bats. Right, okay. Well, look, I'm going to learn a lot uh, right now because of all the questions that are coming in. So, guys, thank you so much for the questions. Keep them coming in. Let us know where you're from. Um, and uh, I'll get you as many as I can, but we've only got five minutes really until we have to move on to the next thing. So let's get you as many as we can. Um, so first of all, let's see. Uh, Lorna Ryan asked, what are the predators of bats? Okay, yes, great question. Well, if you think about what are the big um, birds that are flying at night time? Owls. So owls are quite happily munching bats. And so they're the natural predators of, of, of bats. Now, unfortunately, there is domestic uh, cats can be a bit of a predator. Our cats are amazing hunters. And you saw from the terminal imagery footage with the way the bats, when they emerge from the actual roost, they fall into flight. And you can get some very smart cats that find a nice high wall. And if the bats are emerging in, in, the, in, in the way where the cats are positioned, they will catch them. So we do worry about cats. So if you do have a cat that has occasionally brought a bat in, just bring your cat in around sunset and he won't be able to catch the bats once they've emerged and flown away from the actual roost. Um, but natural predators are just your owls. Okay, great. Loads of um, uh, kids and classes around the country have the same question, um, but I'll highlight Emma from uh, GCNS because she asked loads of questions, and the one that I'll, that I'll pick is the same one that everybody wants to know. They want to know what's your favourite type of bat? And why. Oh, brown long-eared. Brown long-eared bat. Look at him. Those beautiful big ears, and they're also a very curious animal. The amount of times I'd be surveying, and I'm in a, in a barn waiting for the bats to emerge to count them, and the brown long ears that come out and literally just hang up and land beside you and just watch you. It's almost like they're the human surveyors of the bat world, checking out what you're up to. Terribly curious creatures. And I do often wish they'd just go out and feed, fill their bellies, and then they can come back and watch me. 
but uh, overall bats are amazing creatures to uh, to survey great uh let's see we, uh, four class and gray stones uh Mar 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 marilena and olivia want to know what's the largest bat in the world it would be, be the fruit eating bats so like uh, if you kind of think of um it, if you often think of the bats that are portrayed in australia the, these guys are about um two feet long in body length and they have a wingspan of about five feet so they're ginormous creatures in comparison to our little micro bats. And just as a and as additional question, the smallest bat is the bumblebee bat, which is literally half the size of your tongue, and that's found in Eastern Asia. No way! Wow, that that is small. Um, St Paul's BNS asked, what county in Ireland has the most amount of bats, and why? Okay. Um, well. It's going to have to be one of the west of Ireland uh, counties because of the fact the lesser Hershey bats over there. So we 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 did uh, this kind of like all island survey with lots of wonderful volunteers. They spent three years looking at every ten kilometre square around around the country, and the hot spot was County Kerry, and it was Killarney National Park. It had all nine bat species there. So that's that's your your bat hot spot. Okay. Um, Tyler from Ballinus Law National School wants to know, have you ever seen a bat cloud? And uh, no, I've never seen that concentration of bats. Now I've surveyed all across Europe, but I haven't gotten to where those big cave systems are. The most bats I've seen in one congregation is about a thousand bats, but to see the bat clouds it literally mean, it means uh, millions of bats roosting in a cave. So maybe when I retire, I'll get to travel a bit more. And, and where's the best place to see that if you wanted to go? Well, that picture is from one of the caves in Texas in the US. Um, there are amazing big caves in Texas. Uh, one of them is called Bracken Caves, one of the more famous ones. And Back Conservation International will actually bring two people uh, on tours to actually see the clouds as they're coming out at nighttime. So that's one of the best places to go to see them. Okay. Um, Miss Ward's third class in Relton Namara in National School in Dock wants to know, do different species of bats mix well with each other? They do, and this is this is a really interesting thing. Like a lot of buildings I would, would um, survey, they would have two to three bat species roosting in them. They all have their little microclimate, so they like little different temperature gradients in the attic space. So you could have your brown, brown long eared up in the apex of the roof, your lysers bats down beside where the, the roof meets the wall, and then your pipistrels behind the felt. And they'll all keep to their own little space. But even when you actually go serving bats in habitats, because they all have different insects they like to feed on, they're not in competition. So there's no aggressive competition with the bats. The dawbettons are over the river, the pipistrels along the hedgerows, the brown long is inside a tree canopy, and the lysers are high in the sky. So they all kind of have their niches. And as a consequence, they kind of keep down a large number of insect types of insects down uh, as a consequence. Okay, super. Look, we're running out of time. I'll take one more question. This one's uh, from St. Kevin's BNS. How long do bats live for? Oh, I love this question. Bats are really, really unusual. Um, if you think of small mammals, there's a, there's a saying in biology, small means ha uh, a really high heart rate as a consequence of short, short life. Like elephants, really slow heart rate means really long living. But bats are an exception. These are very small mammals, but they tend to live up to 15, 20 years. And the oldest known bat is a 42-year-old Brant's bat that was ringed 42 years ago in the Russian Urals. They live amazing long years. And this is why there's a lot of studies going on, kind of like, why do bats live so long? And it's because their immune system, they can freeze, they can fight illness really really well and this is the reason why they live for so long so the equivalent for a bat uh, if you know the way you kind of talk about dog years and human years the bats can live the equivalent to 272 human years so these are amazingly long-lived mammals wow that is incredible uh well look we're out of time tina but thank you so much for your time and on behalf of all the uh, kids out there that are watching and all the teachers thank you from them as well i'm sure everybody found it really interesting um, if anybody wants to know more about bats, where should they go? Well, the Learn About Bats uh, website is is a great resource. We do have our own just uh, main website, Bat Conservation Ireland, but there's lots of bat groups around the country and always look out for bat walks. 
hopefully next summer we'll be back to all of that kind of like in in uh, in each other's company and be able to actually go to public events and once that happens again we'll be back out doing our bat walks and it's a great way to learn more about bats brilliant thank, well, thank, you. You, thank you very much tina thank you very much for your time um we are going to go straight now in one minute we are going to hand over to uh, leanne from clean coasts um and she's going to talk to us about thinking before we flush see the thing is guys we got to remember that we love the sea we love to swim in the sea we love to go to the beach uh we love our rivers but the river starts in our own house in our with our sink and with our toilets and so leanne's going to come on and she's going to tell us a little bit more about how we should think better about how we uh, what we put put down our toilet and um and and be aware of all the of where the water is and uh, and how we need to take care of it so um we'll come back in one minute and i'll hand over to leanne Hi everyone, Leanne here from Clean Coats and I'm here today to talk to you about our campaign called Think Before You Flush. So for today we're going to talk a little bit about why we do what we do, so why the Think Before You Flush campaign exists and then I'm going to run through two simple experiments to show why it is so important to always think before you flush. Our job at Clean Coast is to help thousands of volunteers to organise hundreds of cleanups every year. These volunteers remove huge amounts of litter from our coastal locations. We run tons of initiatives and we run two campaigns to help teach everybody as to why we need to remove this litter from our coastal locations. Now, as we were cleaning up, we were finding a lot of sewage related litter. So we're talking wet wipes, we're talking uh, cotton bud sticks, stuff that people were, were either mistakenly or without knowing were throwing down the toilet and they didn't realize that this was working its way through the wastewater treatment network and finding its way to our beaches. Because of this, we decided to start up the campaign called Think Before You Flush. John, like a lot of people, tries to be environmentally friendly. He recycles, composts and conserves water. But today his team won the final and the environment isn't really on his mind. What if everyone flushed things they weren't supposed to? Well, the plant has to work hard to clear the water and every once in a while, something could get through. All these little bits add up over time. And if everyone around the world is as careless, then we really are flushing our planet down the toilet. Think before you flush. The Think Before You Flush campaign was started five years ago in partnership with Irish Water to help teach the Irish public about what should and shouldn't be flushed down the toilet. So items like wet wipes, cotton buds, um, sanitary products and even hair should never be flushed down the toilet. These materials can cause blockages in our wastewater network, they can lead to breakdowns of machinery in our wastewater treatment plants. And if they manage to work their way all the way through our system, they can end up on our beaches and in our natural environment. Sewage related litter is the third largest category of litter in our marine environment. So it is always super important to think before you flush. Now, sewage related litter contains a huge amount of plastic most of the time. 
I'm sure you're all very aware of how difficult it is for plastic to break down in our natural environment. In fact, if you're to look at our marine environment, all of the litter contained in our oceans and seas, 80% of it is made of plastic. It causes huge hassle for the animals and plants that live in our seas and oceans. If we're to take wet wipes as an example, 90% of most wet wipes contain plastic. And that's even if they say that they're flushable. So what happens if we flush these? They go into our pipes where they can likely lead to blockages. If they manage to get through the pipes and they get to our wastewater treatment plants, they can clog machinery and the machinery will break down. And if they get through all of that and end up back into our natural environment, they can end up in our oceans and on our beaches and even in our waterways and our rivers. So it is hugely important to make sure we do not flush wet wipes down the toilet. On the other hand, if you're to look at something like toilet paper, toilet paper is really good at breaking down in water. So our wastewater treatment facilities are really good at dealing with toilet paper. To show you about this and to show why it, wet wipes can't be flush, we're going to do a quick experiment called the wet wipe hype. <laughs> so we've tested it and we've seen firsthand that wet wipes do not break down in water and when compared to toilet paper which is really good at breaking down we now know that it's probably not a very suitable thing to be flushing into our wastewater network but what about the infrastructure? Let's test what happens when these items end up in our pipes. So as I said before, they will lead to blockages 
they can lead to machinery breaking down. And then at the end of all that, if they work all the way through our systems, they will end up in our oceans, our seas, on our beaches, and in our waterways. So it's really important that we understand why this happens, and then also make sure that we tell lots of people what things you should and shouldn't flush down the toilet. So, to test this, we're going to pop into our next experiment called pipes. Again, with our pipes experiment, just like our wet wipes experiment, we've seen that sewage related litter items don't break down very easily in water. With the pipes experiment, we've seen that it can cause major issues, blockages, leaks in our wastewater treatment network. These problems can be very expensive to fix, so it's really important we are very aware of what we are flushing down the toilet. It is super important to always think before you flush and it will help protect our marine environment. 
If you remember anything from today, please remember this. Only the three P's get flushed in the toilet. That's pee, poo and paper, toilet paper. Everything else goes in the bin. Thanks very much, guys. Hi Leanne, I just checked hey. out my water there. You have me all turned out about my water now. Thanks very much. How are you? I think I think this one's clean. I, I hope that so. was so I interesting. That was so cool and so interesting. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, for making that video for us and for joining us today. Uh, I hope all the kids watching agrees that that was uh, really eye-opening and it's really going to make us think about uh, about what we flushed down the toilets for sure, you know? I mean, so many things, you think it's okay and out of sight, out of mind, it goes down the toilet and it disappears, but, but that's not the case. Um, we, we've got a couple of questions in from some of the schools and some of the kids watching, but before we start, I wanted to know, uh, in your opinion, if you've been around Ireland, like, let's give some credit some, to some counties out there. Have mm -hmm. you ever come across some coasts that you think, wow, these guys really take care of their beaches? Is there any particular places in Ireland that are really good? Well, I have to say, you know, with Clean Coast, we have a, a group every five kilometres around the coast of, of Ireland. Um, so there's huge communities out there doing a lot of work. Um, I suppose if you're looking at more urban places, anywhere around cities, like specifically you're looking around kind of Dublin as well, you can get a, a bit more stuff ending up on beaches and that's the nature of having a very large population in that area. So I think it'd be unfair to, to say one place over the other because everyone does a great job. It's just there's there's different factors in play for how clean you can kind of keep an area. Yeah, well, look, that's brilliant that, that, that there's so many people all around the country that are doing their bit. But what for anybody watching, like, what can people do at home in their own homes to help out with the environment and make sure that you know sewerage is, is kept under control as much as possible? Yeah, so specifically with the Think Before You Flush campaign, and that's, again, stopping the sewage-related litter making its way to our natural environment. The It's... It, it's fabulous campaign. It's the, one of the easiest campaigns to try and convince people of because all you got to do is put a bin in your bathroom and then just make sure that you flush your pee, poo and paper down the toilet. So again, that's toilet paper. Everything else just goes in the bin. So it's a super simple message. And like, hopefully anyone listening here today can pick up that message and they can go and share it with people because you'd be really surprised how many people aren't aware of what uh, they should be flushing down the toilet. And it's nobody's you know, it's nobody's fault or anything like that. It's just, it's something that maybe people didn't learn when they were younger. And um, so it's great that we have all the kids learning it now. And then hopefully they can go and, and spread the message and teach as many people that it's only pee, poo and paper down the toilet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on that, uh, how can people get involved with Clean Coasts if, they, if, if they're after watching that and they feel like they want to do more? Cool. So there's there's two things you can do. So if you're very passionate about the Think Before You Flush campaign, um, and this is probably more so towards the teachers, uh, but the kids can can ask their parents to do it as well, that we do uh, have a pledge page on the Think Before You Flush 
um, website. So that's thinkbeforeyouflush.org. And you can come on and you can pledge to say that you're only going to flush your pee poo and paper down the toilet. And we can also send you out resources to place around your school and um, to put up in your house. And um, again, just trying to share that message because not everybody knows exactly what you have to be putting down the toilet. Um, on a broader scale, if you would like to help with clean coasts and, and help tidy up our coastal areas, um, you can just jump on to cleancoast.org and you can sign up there. So you can either sign up with a, with a group, you can create a group yourself. So if you're in a school and you would like to, to set up your own group, you can do that. And one of our regional officers will help you out in, they'll get you equipment and they'll just give you advice on how best to do it. Okay, brilliant. Uh, hopefully people watching will, will sign up then. That's that's such a great initiative okay. and it yeah. feels so good to kind of uh, do a little bit and, and see progress and see the work that you did and be, be proud of that. Exactly. Um, and so like, let's, let's, let's go to some questions. Um, we've got, we've got about um, eight minutes until we have to move on to the next thing. So let's take as many as we can. Um, uh, Zitzlaw Kalutskinski, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, had a really good question. Why are baby wipes made from plastic? I didn't know that. Why are they? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I suppose baby wipes are going to be made from plastic because they're going to be a bit more substantial. Like if you think about if you're, I don't know, if you're trying to wipe up a mess or like even if we take any sort of wipes, so not just baby wipes, that it could be kind of the wipes that you use to clean your kitchen. If you start getting toilet paper and trying to wipe that down, the toilet paper is going to disintegrate really quickly, which is the purpose of toilet paper. So it's great so that it disintegrates quite quickly. Um, in the the wastewater network, um, so when we're we're maybe doing more robust things with wipes, for that it needs to be made of a stronger material, and that material is unfortunately plastic. Um, so you know, and as I said again, like ninety percent of it is really made up of plastic, so it's a huge amount. I suppose from our point of view, we don't want to be telling people to do things necessarily differently. We're just very happy to make sure that people are aware that it's only pee, poo, and paper that go down the toilet. But from a broader scale, you, you know, you could have a more sustainable product. You could just use the cloth and um, something like that. But yeah, it's good to know. It's something that maybe not everyone is aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, uh, Balanamine School ha had the exact same question. And I, I also followed it up by asking, uh, why is waste released into the ocean? I mean, you know, why yeah. does it have to be put out there? This is it. So, um, so there's the main one of the main reasons when we have um, blockages or issues within the wastewater treatment plant is that and it's only in very extreme circumstances. But if there's major issues and there's a, there's maybe a lot of water coming in through the system, they have to do an emergency release and an emergency overflow into the water. And um, it's it's unfortunate. It's the way that the system works, and um, but it's the only way to deal with that backlog. Um, once it goes like that. So unfortunately, you know, the system is just not created in Ireland to deal with um, wet wipes. And it really anywhere, like it is just being put poo and paper. And to be honest, we're quite lucky to be able to put toilet paper down a toilet. If you've been to, you know, if you've been to different places around the world, you, toilet paper has to go into the bin. It doesn't actually go into the toilet. So we've got a really good system here. It's um, it, it's it, it will be high up there in kind of the world rankings of of toilet systems and wastewater treatment systems. Um, but yeah, it's just not built to take those products, and they just cause such damage. Um, when 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 they are flushed, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, and um, uh, fifth class in Inch um, National School in uh, Killa. Uh, they just brought up a point that a lot of people that live out the countryside have their own septic tanks and sewerage yeah. tanks. Uh, so what happens when, let's say, a, a wet wipe gets flushed down the toilet there uh, when it doesn't necessarily yeah. go into the ocean? So, it, it, you know, it, even in septic tanks, it's nearly worse because septic tanks are not built to take these other products. So, again, it's pee, poo and paper that goes into them and um, <clears throat> I suppose within your septic tank you're you know when you add other products to it it's, it's not going to do the job that is supposed to do so yeah like absolutely septic tanks don't be throwing anything in there that isn't just your pee poo and paper yeah and and on that uh, both uh, Balanamine and Miss Dunn's third class um, ask the same question now look we know that only the three peas need to go down the toilet we know mm -hmm. that now but is there anything in particular you want to warn people about that is extra bad 
Yeah, so I suppose, like, I've gone through kind of wet wipes um, is, is a big issue. We are actually, we, we've recently done a survey and, and within Ireland, it is improving quite a lot um, of what people are putting or not putting in the toilet, as the case may be. Um, but something that I think maybe people aren't so aware of is, um, so like wet wipes, big problem, sanitary products. So your, your tampons or your uh, pads or even the packaging for that. Sometimes because people might be a little bit embarrassed of where to put it and there is no bin in the bathroom and they'll end up putting it down the toilet. Um, and then the one thing that people aren't so aware of is hair. So hair acts- I'm not aware of it. Yeah, so hair will not break down in our system. And if enough of it will go into the system, it can tangle around machinery. It can also cause blocked pipes very easily as well. So like, if you think of like, oh, you're just throwing your little bit of hair down the, the toilet, but if everybody does that, Unfortunately, it just doesn't break down and it's going to it's going to cause damage to our system. And whether it's your own pipes where that ends up being an issue or whether it's further down the system and then it's a, a very expensive issue for everybody, really. Yeah, all my pipes are blocked at home and now I know what happened. Okay, thanks, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> so, so St. Luke's National School had a really good question. So we can't throw baby wipes down the toilet. What can we do? With, what can we do with them? What bin do they go in? Um, so they're unfortunately just going to have to go into the the your general waste <clears throat> bin. So the the easiest thing to do, and in, in one of the videos there, there was an image of it, is just to have a well. You could just have a general waste bin in the bathroom, but I find it's quite good to have a general waste bin and then something that you can recycle in as well. So if people have, you know, <clears throat> um, packaging or if they have toilet rolls that they can put them in there, but just make it as easy as possible for everybody to to dispose of their waste within the bathroom and not down the toilet. It's very important. Super. Um, and then Jessica, uh, on that, Jessica Prenton asked, what's the best, most successful and sustainable alternative to using wet wipes? Do you have any tips on that? I would honestly say a cloth. <laughs> so just a regular cloth. Um, so it, now I suppose there are some people who use wet wipes like for after they go to the toilet and you wouldn't want to be using a particularly a cloth for that. Uh, but if you could use toilet paper in that situation, it would be best. Um, but yeah, just a regular cloth with some with some nice soap um, works really, really well. Yeah, and uh, our next guest, Joanna, um, also uh, pitched in by saying, or just don't use them. Or just, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So just, you know, I suppose, Cloths have been around for, for many, many years um, and they do a great job of cleaning things. Obviously, you have to make sure that you wash them and, you know, don't use them too much on the same thing. But uh, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, and then, uh, look, uh, Balan Amin, guys, you've been so uh, engaged today. Thank you so much for all the questions. We'll take, we'll take the last one from them as well then. And they seem particularly concerned about penguins because they wanted to know what effect does plastic have on penguins? So with, with any, any marine bird, um, plastic is a huge issue. Um, often, so birds have a really good sense of smell um, and, they, it's, and they end up hunting quite a lot with their smell. So seabirds especially. And um, so they might sniff something, it might be absolutely miles out, but they're able to go get it. And often um, plastics will end up taking on the smell of their food. And um, so they can end up ingesting this mistakenly um so yeah so like we've seen issues around kind of the microplastics but even larger plastics birds can end up ingesting them and it, it can it can um uh, make them struggle with eating food with their digestive system in general um so yeah so it's 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 a really unfortunate issue like plastic is in our system um so all, all we can do to kind of reduce that as much as possible and with clean coast you know these volunteering groups are trying to remove them from so the stuff that's already there trying to remove it from the system as much as possible uh, but yeah it's not it's not the best for penguins unfortunately yeah or or, or any animal by the by right. yeah. so uh, yeah. leanne look that takes us to the end of our session so thank you so much your knowledge is amazing and i hope all the kids watching have learned a few things and are motivated now to go home and tell their mammies and their daddies to stop putting things down the toilet that don't start with pee Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ed. That was Thanks great. for your time. I'll, All right. I'll see you again. So guys, that, so guys, that takes us back to uh, on to the next thing now. And um, 
we're halfway through our Let's Talk Science um, uh, event. So at this point, just to say a big thank you to Science Foundation Ireland and Dublin City Council for helping make this happen. Um, broadcast live here from the Rediscovery Centre in Ballymun. Uh, we're delighted to host it. Thank you so much everybody who's still on the line from earlier on. Uh, and a big welcome to those who have just joined us. Please put your questions into the chat because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about all things weather related. So I'm sure everybody has loads of questions. And to answer those questions, we have our own expert. You see her on the telly every day. And uh, here comes Joanna Donnelly from Met Aaron. Hi, Joanna. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me well enough? Yeah, I can hear you great. Thanks oh, very much. So, look at, so great. let's just cut to the chase. You don't know whether it's a white Christmas or not, okay? Let's just get that question out of the way. Why does everybody keep asking me about white Christmas? No, we don't know yet. The likelihood of a white Christmas in Ireland is quite low. It doesn't really get cold enough and wet enough at the same time for us to get white Christmases here. And even if it, we were likely to get a white Christmas, we wouldn't be able to forecast that far ahead. It's still too far away. We can forecast for about three or four days ahead. Um, and the, on the long range forecast, we get about 10 to 15 days. But if we could see 10 to 15 days ahead, I'd be able to tell you it definitely wasn't going to be a white Christmas because then we would need precipitation, which doesn't come with high pressure, which is the only way we can see 10 or 15 days. Yeah. Well, look, Joanna, I just wanted to get that question out of the way because I know everybody in the country is going to want to know that. So uh, now that's the answer. Um, uh, Joanna, look, I'll hand over to you um, if you want to uh, tell us a couple of things that the kids might like to know. And um, what we'll do is I'll come back in then when you're finished uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take questions from the audience then. Is that okay? I froze there. Did you, did you lose me? Uh, oh, that's okay. You're back again. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I'll, look at, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Joanna, if there's anything that you want to talk to all the kids about. There's hundreds of schools and, and families all around the country are uh, dialed in right now. Um, so if you wanted to um, tell them a couple of things about um, that, that, that you wanted to share with them. Uh, and then when, when, when you're ready, we'll, we'll take questions that they might have then. There's loads of questions coming in already. I always love the questions part, but I'll give you the brief synopsis in case anybody doesn't know what a meteorologist is. I'm a meteorologist and I work in METAIR and that's the center, the national center for weather and climate here in Ireland. So we monitor what the weather is like at the moment and using a lot of computer modeling and a lot of data, we predict what the weather is going to be in the short term and that's what a weather forecaster does. And now getting more and more pertinent to where we're living at the moment in terms of the world, the climate, what the climate is likely to be like in the in the near future. So that we, we have experts in climatology looking at um, climate change and how it's likely to affect us here in Ireland and our position in the world, of course. But in the meantime, my job is to predict the next few days. And also more and more, my job is about communicating all things weather science related. So I'm here today to talk weather science with you guys. I'm looking forward to the questions. I can see them. They're distracting me in the corner of my eye. They're peeping up on my screen. So I'm looking forward to, to reading those and answering them later. I'll try to give you, first of all, just a few minutes brief rundown of what I do. Um, so my the start of my day, I go into my office or at the moment I'm working from home like a lot of people. So today I'm working from home. That's my my favorite map there on the screen behind me, it's an old antique map. So this is my office desk here at home. Later on today, I'll be heading into RTE and I'll be on um, TV later on um, after the news predicting the weather. So when I start my day, the first thing I do is I look at what the weather is like at the moment. So I look at satellite pictures. They're really, really handy. They didn't exist when I was starting in work. Well, they existed, but not the way they do now. So I turn up my computer and I have a look at a satellite picture. So that's a picture taken from the satellites high up in our um, atmosphere, looking down on the clouds. And I, from looking at those clouds from above, I can see what the weather systems are like across Ireland and nearby in the Atlantic. You can't see it from down here when you look up at the clouds because they just look like gray or white blobs in the sky. But looking down on them, they make a bigger pattern. And I can see from those patterns what the weather is going to be like for the next few days. The first thing I look at is a satellite picture. Next thing I look at is a radar picture, and that shows me where the rain, if there's any rain, is falling over Ireland. So the first two big things I look at, satellite and radar. 
The next thing I look at is the weather charts. Those are called isobaric charts, and they are a drawing of what the air pressure systems look like across the world at the moment. So we've got two types of pressure systems. We've got a high pressure system and a low pressure system. In a low pressure system, air is rising, and when air rises, it condenses, it forms clouds, and those bring rain. So low pressure system, real simply put, brings cloud and rain. The other pressure system is a high pressure system. In a high pressure system, air is descending, and in the increasing in air, air pressure there clears off the cloud and clears away the rain, so high pressure systems are dry. Two of those are bumping off each other, and where air masses meet, that's changing in um, ter air temperatures, you get weather fronts. Weather fronts are usually wrapped around low pressure systems and steered by low pressure systems, and where the Weather fronts are, you get winds and rain and changing in um, weather systems. So those are the big things that I'm looking for. I look as well for observations on the weather. So at 10 to the hour, every hour, all around Ireland and all around the world, we take what were called weather observations. So a weather observation is a measure of what the weather is like at any particular point in time and in any particular place. So mostly they're taken at the surface. So we'll say we take a reading of what the air pressure is, the air temperature, the wind direction, the wind speed, the dew point temperature, that's the temperature at which the water in the air turns into a liquid. So that's a very important temperature for us. We don't really talk about it very much on the weather, but it tells us how much moisture is likely to turn to rain in the air. So we need the dew point temperature. It's for working out relative humidity and how the air feels. I'm going to cough. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> <coughs> I'm really sorry about that. Um, I've got asthma, so I have to cough every now and again. It's really bad in COVID times, but sorry. Um, good job I do, don't do that on TV or I get into terrible trouble. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, I was talking about the dew point temperature. So the dew point temperature tells us what the relative humidity is. And from that, we know how it's going to feel because sometimes um, the relative humidity really affects how we feel. That's the way our body adju uh, adjusts our temperature to make us feel warmer or hotter in the weather. Now, I'm losing track of myself. Where am I? Oh, yeah, I'm still on the observations. So that's why, because the cough turned my um, head there. I, I forgot where I was. So I have to look at these observations. They're written in a little code. I look at them on a chart, and I'm able to see then how uh, the weather is shaping up on the ground around Ireland. And I also look at them at the surface. So airport airplanes send us weather observations, and we send up weather balloons up into the sky, and they send back weather information from the weather observed above us, which is also really important because the weather above us steers the weather at the ground and if I know what the weather above us to the west is like then I can tell what weather is coming on the ground towards us. So I spend a good deal of time observing the weather first of all making sure I know what the weather is going to be like at the moment because it's very very hard to try to predict what the weather is going to be like in the future if I don't know what the weather is like at the moment. So once I've observed the weather what it's like at the moment I start to look through the computer models. And then the computer models take all that information too and use it to predict what the weather is going to be like in the next few days. So I make sure that the, the weather models have a good track of what the weather is like at the moment and make adjustments in timing or intensity of rain or strengths of wind. And then I produce my weather forecast. And when I produce my weather forecast in my head, I create some uh, graphics to go with them. So I make pictures of the weather that look exactly like the words in my head. And those are the pictures you see behind me when I'm on the news uh, on TV after the web, after the news, doing the weather on TV after the news. So um, that's a very short synopsis of what I do. And I'm going to stop with my speech now because um, your questions are much more interesting than anything I can talk about. And there's, we'll start answering questions, there's and loads then we'll, we'll come back. And, yeah, yeah there's, there's loads of questions coming in, Joanna. So what I can do is actually um, put them up on the screen here. So uh, is that okay? If I pop them up on the screen, we can uh, Yeah, them. then we can all see them. So um, so the first first one there that comes in, um, what should somebody study in school or university if they want to become a meteorologist? 
That's very promising, Ed, isn't it? That means that people are already thinking they want to be a meteorologist. So I'm delighted to see that question right up. Um, I studied maths, so you need to study either maths or physics. Um, some people get a bit off put when they think maths is really hard, but maths is not really hard. It's just a different way of thinking. And all you have to do to be good at maths is practice maths. So when you're in school there, you're all in primary school, just keep on doing your tables, doing your long division and multiplication, keep practicing so that you're so good at maths, you're as good at maths as you are at your ABCs. And when you go into the secondary school as well, it gets a little bit tricky right at the beginning of secondary school when they start introducing letters instead of numbers, and that's mostly algebra. And you, you go, oh no, and even I did, and I loved maths in first year. I was like, oh, I'm scared of maths, but just practice. Just sit down and practice. You know the way your teacher will give you five questions to do at night? And do 10. And you'll get really, really good at maths. Keep being good at maths, and then you can be a meteorologist. Great. Thanks very much. Let's move on then. So the next question is, comes in from, I think, some of you anonymous. Why are clouds white? Mm, good question. Clouds aren't white. <laughs> Anybody that's ever been in an airplane will know that you can fly through them. So they're obviously not white. They're made up of water vapor condensing into water droplets. They will reflect the light that shines upon them. So uh, usually a lot of the light coming through the atmosphere is comes through as white light, but we all know that light separates into its component colors, which are Richard of York, Ed Battle and Bain, red, yellow, orange, blue, green, indigo, and violet. So when the sun is setting and the, the, the light is split up into its uh, different pieces, some of the clouds can look beautiful colors, reds and golds and pinks and oranges. And sometimes when it's really thick, dense cloud, not a lot of light is getting through and the clouds get darker and darker and darker and they can be almost black. So clouds themselves um, are effectively transparent, but it's the little water droplets are reflecting the light back at you that they're seeing, like a little mirror. Wow, so cool. Uh, Evie mm -hmm. McCarthy from Miss O'Brien's fourth class asks, are weather balloons real balloons? Yes, weather balloons are big, giant balloons. They're made of a kind of a, a it's like a, a silvery aluminium sort of fabric. Um, they're, they get really, really, really big because we need them to go really, really high up into the atmosphere. So they're big balloons, probably as tall, little taller than I am uh, and a lot wider. And they blow up and they go all the way up into the sky. They're real balloons for sure. And they come down. And if you find them, they, they're, they're, they're carrying a little box of um, weather equipment. And they have our name and address on them. So if you find one, send it back to us. We'd really appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, just uh, popping around the corner here to Ballymun. Uh, Taylor is bringing up Christmas again. Wants to know uh, what do you think the, the percentage chance is? I mean, you've answered this already. Mm. But... But can I actually add to that? Because is it just me or has it been a particularly warm October and November? And and does that have a knock-on effect to December and January as well? Very good. Uh, very good, Ed. And a very good question from Taylor, too. Um, your percentage chance, I don't know. You, probably, you know who you ask for the percentage chance is Paddy Power. He's, he'll know <laughs> because you can bet on it, all right? Um, uh, I don't actually know what the percentage chance is. It, it depends on the weather system that's over us at the time. Now, there's a thing called the jet stream. The jet stream is a, an area of really strong winds that separates the warm air from the tropics with the cold air from the Arctic. That jet stream moves north and south depending on whether the Earth is tilted away or towards the sun. So the Earth tilts um, when the northern hemisphere tilts away from the sun in autumn. So the jet stream moves south, and in the summer, the northern hemisphere tilts towards the sun, and the jet stream moves north. Ireland is positioned just where the jet stream hangs out, so that's why we get very variable weather. If the jet stream goes north of us, we're on the mild side of that warm air, and if the jet stream goes south, we're on the cold side, and at the moment, we're on the warm side. So during this week, the jet is going to come down a little bit and we'll just peak into the cold air and then it's going to go up again and we'll be going back into the warm air again. So usually at this time of year, the jet is, for, is further south and we're in the cold air. So we're, we're on the wrong side of the jet is what the short answer is there. Okay. 
Very good, thank you. Let's see, uh, Nathan from Korea National School. Is it difficult to tell the weather forecast in front of the green screen? I think that's a, I think that's a really good question because y you know exactly where to point and yet you, yeah. you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> I um, I've been doing it on the TV now for, what is it, about five years? Maybe six? I don't know. But I've been a weather forecaster for nearly 20, nearly 20 years. Um, and the fir first time I went over, to, see my map behind me, let's pretend that's the map that's on the screen. The first time I went to RTE, I was trying to point. Yeah. I didn't know where my finger was, but now I can do it. As you can see, I can do it automatically. I can point to, there's Dublin. There's Scotland, there's London. You see, I can do it without even, with even looking. You get used to it, but it's not easy. And also you have to make your hand flat like this because it's a green screen and your hand is chopped out by the green screen. And if you put your hand like this, it disappears. So you have to turn your hand like this, which is really awkward. You should all try it. It's really hard to make your hand turn like that and be comfortable as well. So no, it's not easy. It is difficult. Um, Mary, uh, one, uh, sorry, uh, Tori would like to know, can you read weather patterns from clouds? Yeah, from both, but not from below. So when I'm looking down on the clouds using a satellite picture, the clouds can form up into different spirally shapes. Um, and in areas of high pressure, um, the clouds disappear. So I can see where areas of high pressure. Now it's not um, really exact, but um, it, it, it's pretty good pretty easy and uh and another uh, kind of on that as well then so uh Bella and Amin, uh, i want to know what is the most difficult weather to forecast is there such a thing um i'll tell you what's the most difficult weather to forecast weather that makes people happy because people are so hard to please it's too hot it's too cold it's too wet it's too dry it's too windy it's not windy enough because some sailors and kayakers and wind surfers like a bit of wind and the rest of us don't and um, some people don't like it so hot and some people like it so cold. But in terms of actual what difficult, what weather is most difficult, it's probably fast moving low pressure systems because they can fly through before the models have a chance to properly simulate it into the weather. So um, I would say fast moving small areas of low pressure. And they tend to come through Ireland because they, they're steered by the jet. Yeah. And I guess when you say that there's going to be a heat wave and then there's no heat wave, that's also very difficult to... That's, that's, that's part of the pleasing people thing, Ed. But I will say that um, I know Irish people tend to be very quick to put ourselves down and slag Ireland and slag everything from Ireland. Um, and our weather is very, very changeable because of where we are, because of that jet coming directly on us. We're in a very unique position. We have great weather here in Ireland, Goldilocks weather, not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, not too dry. Um, it gives us the greatest grass in the world, which is, gives us the best meat in the world. So we have the best weather, but accordingly, it is very, very difficult to get it right, to forecast it well. So I'm happy to say that being a forecaster in Ireland sets me up as being one of the, <laughs> in in one of the best places for forecasting in terms of difficulty, in terms of how difficult it is to forecast, which is which is great for me as a as a meteorologist. Yeah, and it's, uh, and it's great for us to know that we live in the greatest country. Um, <laughs> let's move on to uh, our Lady of Fashion School in Wexford. Want to know what is your favourite part of your job? Good question, because it's changing a lot um, in the recent times. I'm getting asked to do a lot of uh, weather communication, which I'm really enjoying. I love talking to kids. I love talking to adults. I love talking. You can probably tell. I never stop. Um, so I, I'm really enjoying that aspect of my job. I'm really enjoying the science communication part. I've always loved maths, and I've always loved working out the weather. But I suppose I've been doing that for so long that it's getting a little bit the same. So this new turn that the job is taking, where it's becoming more of a science communicator, is um, is really I'm really enjoying that at the moment. Great. Um, let's see. So uh, Kilcoe National School and and several other people actually want to know how long you have been a meteorologist yourself. Um, for what what year is it? It's 2021. Um, 21 years. 21 years. It, it's easy to remember because I was promoted in 2000. 
So 21 uh, years. Well, you must have started when you were 10. Um, so uh, Fiona <laughs> uh, wanted to know, what are the orange things you see at the airport? <laughs> I don't know what we're talking about. Well, that's, well, that's um, the airport. Are, are we talking about those wind socks? Are we those, um, are they are they shaped in a, like a flag? Are they? Yeah. Is that, what, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, probably. That's a, we'll that's a we'll probably have to ask the airport down. that, will we? Yeah, I think they're on the um, runways. I think they're wind socks and they tell us the, the wind direction. That's really important for taking off and landing. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit um, and uh, about about presenting the weather. Um, did it take, um, uh, uh, Korea National School asked, um, did it take long for you to kind of get that right? How long does it take to actually practice being in front of the camera? Um, not that long. You have to do it while you're doing your own job as well. So you don't get to just stop doing your job and go train to be uh, do the different job. And there's a lot of aspects to it. So you have to get it all right. I suppose if you were trained up in everything else, if I was trained up in how to observe the weather, how to predict the weather, how to construct a weather forecast, use the graphic. If all that was was done then learning to stand in front of the camera and do this doesn't take that long maybe just a couple of weeks but it depends on where you're coming from because you have to have the whole package very good um kilko asked what did you actually want to be yourself when you were younger you didn't no know. idea i i knew that i loved to communicate i love debating i love um talking and I like people so that's why I think I'm really enjoying my job at the moment because I love this bit but the only thing I was ever any good at in school was math <laughs> I didn't do anything else so um the fact that I got to do science as a job is the best thing ever the best thing for me great science is fantastic uh Balan, I mean, back again with another great question the pictures behind you that's on the green screen that we see where do they come from yeah yeah, I create those using a graphics, a graphics package. So we've got a lot of computers in my office. I've got on my normal desk and in work, I've got four screens here in front of me. I've got three screens. And one of them would be dedicated to working on the computer graphics. And it's a, it's a complete package on its own. We send the weather data into it and we construct those pictures using um, this weather weather package system. So they're pre-constructed and then we can change them to make the picture look as we want to. And I make a, a, a sequence depending on what the weather is. And then I do clicker to click through them. Well done. I always assumed you had a team of like 10 um, graphic designers in your office doing all that for you. No, nope, that's not the just case. Me. Uh, okay, great. Well, Carla asked, um, Oh, sorry, a, a third class actually in our ladies by school. They want to know why does the sky look blue? Very good. Okay, so we, we did the rainbow earlier on, didn't we? Um, red, yellow, orange, green, blue, indigo and violet. So the way light comes out of the sun all comes together and we see it as a white light. But as it travels through the atmosphere, it is even though the particles of light, they can't even see them, they're so tiny, they still get scattered. So they get scattered into their component parts and the sky above us is like a giant rainbow and it looks blue because that's the part of the light that has been scattered out into, it was an Irish scientist actually that discovered that. And um, so that's why we're looking at a blue sky. Of course, we know that we're not always looking at the blue sky. The color of the sky changes depending on the time of day and how we're looking at it. And you know that beautiful sunsets can sometimes look pink and orange and green. And that's because the angle of the sun compared to where we are is changing and we're getting to see a different part of the rainbow effectively up in the sky above us. Okay, um, let's stay looking at the sky because New Park Comprehensive School wants to know what causes the aurora borealis. Very good question. Where where's the school? New Park. Where's New Park? I'm not sure. New Park. Where are you from? Yeah. What county are you in? They'll they'll tell us in the comments. But um, yeah, okay. what's That's the northern lights? Parts, also known as? Yeah, yeah. Some parts of the country can better see it. Of course, in in Donegal, they get treated to the aurora borealis. Um, in the in the depths of the winter 
pretty often, I suppose, depending on the, the weather conditions. Um, they're caused by, now this isn't, this isn't my area of expertise, so I'm, I'm making it up, no I'm not. Um, it's caused by the electromagnetic interference with the movements of the very high level winds. So it's, um, it's not technically in the lower layers of the atmosphere, it's, hap it's happening around, around the poles because of the electromagnetic um, activity there. And it, it's just sometimes we can see it because the way the atmosphere is bent, we can see what's happening further away and across the horizon because the, the, the light bends back into the, into the thing. But it's caused by um, electromagnetic activity as far as I can um, I'd, I'd love to see them. Um, They're amazing, yeah. 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 So uh, Tristan and Mr. Carty's class wants to know, does it rain more in the west than the east? I would say yes, because it's always raining in Galway night I'm there. Sorry, any schools in Galway, but I bet you it's raining right now, isn't it? <laughs> um, it does, actually. It does rain in the west more than in the east. In fact, um, Dublin in particular is pretty dry. It's one of the driest capital cities in Europe. Would you believe wow. Dublin? And that's because we've got a prevailing southwesterly wind, or and um, it, the winds come up over the mountains. There's a ring of mountains around Dublin to the to the south and west of us, and all the rain comes off on the mountains, and then it, they act it like a, an umbrella on um, Dublin. In the west, particularly in Galway and all of along the west coast, you've got no mountains out there to the west protecting you, so you've got all the weather fronts coming directly off the Atlantic and um, giving you the rain along the western coast. And also our prevailing west or southwest winds and northwesterly oftentimes in the winter in particular bring showers off the sea and onto coasts. The sea surface temperature is often warmer than the land temperature, which gives rise to convection over sea. So the showers come off the sea onto the coast during the winter, the land is too cold, the convection dies out, and the showers don't carry inland. So coastal areas, in particular of the west and northwest, get more rain. And that's why you'll hear it in the forecast. We'd say um, showers will retreat to the west. Showers will be mostly on western coasts, north and northwest coasts. That's why we say that. <laughs> OK. So, sorry, West. Um, let's see. Wrong tree in Girl School, Escarida wants to know why rain is measured in millimetres. And how that works because they actually measured 0.6 millimeters rain in Lucan in the last 24 hours in their yard. Isn't that cool? Oh, it is very cool that they're measuring the weather, isn't it? That's really great news. Um, I love to hear that. Uh, why is rain measured in millimeters? There's a great thing on the web I read years ago about uh, the metric system. Um, we use the metric system because the metric system makes the most sense. Um, it takes one degree of energy to, or one joule of energy, what is it, to heat one gram of water to one degree Celsius or something like that. It, 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 it's very um, concise and automatic. So we use the metric system for everything, except in aviation, we use um, feet, and except in the sea when we use knots. But uh, everything on land is uh, in millimeters and in the metric system. Great. Okay. Uh, we only have time for maybe one, two more questions, and then we have to move on. So, uh, White Church National School in Rathfarnham wants to know, how do you send weather balloons up? Very good question. They're released from uh, our weather station in Valencia, and they there's a whole big machine to do it. They, there's a the, the balloon is inflated indoors, obviously, because if they inflated it outdoors, it fly away. Um, and there's a giant door over it that opens like this, and the, the balloon goes out the door. Um, I think it might be on our web, on our website, www.met.ie. There's about us, and I think there's an education section as well, and you might see further down, if you scroll down past the forecast, you'll see lots of um, information there, and I think there might be an article about our weather balloons in there. Okay. Fantastic. Let's take one more question because uh, Megan wants to know what's the weather looking like today? It's getting better. It was very windy this morning. My son cycled off to school this morning and I felt very guilty because he was going out in the wind. Um, it was very windy today, but the winds are easing up because we've got a ridge of high pressure coming over us. That's going to kill off the wind. It's also going to kill off the, the rain. I see a little tiny bit of blue coming in my sky, so it's getting drier. 
and it's getting easier and the temperatures aren't going to change. Joanna, thank you so much for joining us today, for, for dialing in and taking some time out of your busy day. Um, uh, are you going to be on the TV later? I am. Okay, well, will I'm you give us a wave there. like this and we'll know that you're talking to us. And uh, thanks everybody who tuned in for all the fantastic questions as well. So sorry that we couldn't get through them all. Hopefully we answered as many as we could. Um, but uh, we're out of time and we're going to move on now. So, so thanks every, everybody who's still with us. And if you are excited about wanting to take part in a geographic murder mystery, then that's about to start right now. And we're joined with Elspeth from iCrag, who I'm going to bring in now. Elspeth, Hello. what have you got for us for our last session here for Let's Talk Science? What is happening? Well, <clears throat> what we're going to do is use geology um, to solve a murder. Wow. Okay. This sounds really exciting. Look, I'm going to hand over to you and I'll let you take over. I'll jump back in if I've got any questions from our YouTube channel for you. But for the time being, you you fire away. Just to really quickly, one more time, thank you. thanks uh, to uh, Science Foundation Ireland and Dublin City Council for ha helping us uh, put this on today. Um, it's, been, it's been going really well so far and we're delighted with the interaction. Um, but uh, let's solve some murders. Over to you, Elspeth. Thank you. Great. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Elspeth and I'll be guiding you through today's workshop. Before we get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the background of this workshop. This workshop was originally designed for Girls into Geoscience Ireland by myself and my colleague Dr Emma Morris a couple of years ago. Girls into Geoscience Ireland, you can see the logo down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, Girls into Geoscience Ireland is the Irish branch of Girls into Geoscience, which was originally started in the UK. Girls into Geoscience Ireland is an all island initiative that aims to inspire young people with the sciences, specifically geoscience. Although we started off as an initiative focused on female identifying people, Girls into Geoscience is open to absolutely everyone that's interested in the role geoscience can play in their future. We offer an annual event day, workshops, talks, and hopefully soon even a mini research project for you to work on with real scientists. You can learn more about the Girls into Geoscience Ireland initiative by visiting our website. Now, on to today's workshop. Well, what you're looking at here is an evidence board, an evidence board for the case that the guards are calling the Jealous Jedi. Not very imaginative if you ask me, but hey ho. So, the scenario. A body has been found and the guards are stumped as to who the killer might be. They have called on experts from the geoforensics team to see whether they can unearth any clues to help decipher this mystery. First things first, what is geoforensics? Geoforensics is the branch of forensic science that uses geology and specifically geological traces to help in police cases. Geoforensics is a real thing and it is a subject that you can go on and specialise at some universities if you're interested. So what are geological traces? Well, think about your shoes after you've been for a walk in the mud. They get covered, right? So this mud is actually a record, a trace of where you've been. If a forensic geologist was presented with the mud from your shoes, they could trace it back to the area in nature that you picked it up. Some of the things a forensic geologist might do include locating crime scenes, linking suspects to locations, and finding out whether the evidence has been moved between locations. So, for example, if the sediment on the evidence doesn't match the surroundings that the evidence was discovered in, you could say that it was moved. In the last example, I use the term sediment. Sediment comes from the breakdown of rocks and it is a vital component of geological traces that geoforensic scientists study. The breakdown of rocks is called weathering and that produces sediment. You may have come across the term weathering in science or geography lessons at school. There are three different types of weathering, biological, this is where something biological breaks down the rocks, like when tree roots split open the pavement. Could be chemical, this is where the rock is broken down by chemical substances, for example, acid rain. And finally, physical weathering. F 
physical weathering is the most common example of weathering, and it occurs when force is applied to the rock to break it down. So think about the stone steps of old buildings. They have a dip in them, in, kind of in the middle, um, and that's been caused by the physical weathering of people stepping on them all day for hundreds of years. Other more common examples that you might have heard of in geography lessons include freeze-thaw weathering, or thermal expansion, sorry, and contraction, or onion skin weathering. Examples of the creation of sediment through weathering include the breakdown of cliffs, soft sort of cliffs, like sandstone cliffs, that can break down into sand. So if you look here, you can see the layers of the rock and then a big slump of sand that's come away from there as it's been broken down. Also, chalk is a really good example um, because the sediment from the chalk is what sticks to the board. So it rubs off on the board and your hands when, you, when you're writing on the board um, and it creates the lines that we can see. So this is where geoforensics come in. If we look at the sediment on your clothes, we can tell where you've been. Maybe, for example, you decided to go for a walk along the beach one day. Sand from the beach would stick to your shoes and clothes, no matter how much you tried to shake it off, some still remains, tiny little particles that you'd never be able to see with the naked eye. A forensic geoscientist could look at the sediment on your shoes and clothes, isolate it and match it to the location that you visited. So now we know the background, let's get started on the case. So, Veteran Star Wars actor Mark Hamill has been found dead and four fellow Star Wars actors are suspected of his murder. You are the forensic geologist that the guards are calling upon to help solve the case. It's up to you to use your geoforensic skills to work out who the murderer was. We know this much about the movements of the victim in the days before he was killed. The victim, Mark, completed filming on Skellig Michael and decided to travel the wild Atlantic way with some fellow Star Wars actors. The actors all did the same trip, however, they did not all visit the same places. So let's have a look at the locations along the wild Atlantic way that the actors may have visited. First up, we have Skellig Michael. So Skellig Michael is a steep pyramidal rock with two peaks. It juts out of the sea about 12 kilometres off the coast of County Kerry. The island, which was used for the filming uh, during the most recent Star Wars trilogy, has monastic links and it actually has a monastery and a hermitage on the island. Geologically speaking, the islands are predominantly made of old red sandstone and slate. So old red sandstone, surprisingly, is known for its vivid red colour, and that's actually a result of the iron in the rock, which is oxidised, so basically rusted. The rocks that make up the islands were deposited during the Devonian period, over 360 million years ago. At this time, Ireland was part of a larger continental landmass that was south of the equator. The high peaks and steep ridges of the island formed during the Variscan period of folding and mountain formation. This was about 300 million years ago. The mountain building event compressed the rocks that formed Skellig Michael, resulting in lots of fractures and jointing and north-south faulting. So the uh, mountain building and compression there is actually thought to be related to the formation of the Alps. And all of this fracturing and faulting has made some of the bedrock more brittle. So this is what's actually caused the depression between the two peaks on the island. When the Atlantic Ocean levels began to rise, it created deep marine inlets that left the skeletons detached from the mainland. So that's why it's an island today. Moving on to the Midlands. The next location is the Cliffs of Mirror. A premier tourist attraction, the cliffs are located on the Atlantic coast of County Clare. They stretch for about 14 kilometres and reach a maximum height of 214 metres. These rocks are younger than in the last location, having been formed between 326 and 313 million years ago from sandstones and mudstones. These rocks record an ancient delta system, like the Mississippi, where a river would have carried water and sediment all the way to the ocean, where the sand, silt and clay it transported were deposited into an ancient marine basin. Over millions of years, 
the sediment collecting at the mouth of this ancient delta were compacted and lithified, so turned into rock, um, and made into the sedimentary strata that are preserved today in the well-exposed cliffs. Trace fossils, which are the imprints of ancient animals, are abundant within the rocks. You can see feeding trails and burrow marks. Today, the cliffs are subject to erosion by the waves, which undermines the base of the cliff and causes them to collapse under their own weight. This process creates a variety of coastal landforms, characteristic of erosional coasts, such as sea caves, sea stacks and sea stumps. The third location is the Burren, located to the north of the Cliffs of Moa that we've just visited. So the Burren is a glaciated karst landscape. It's one of the finest examples of glacial karst landscapes in the world. The rocks that make up the Burren were deposited during the Carboniferous. They are predominantly limestones with sun sands, some sandstones, mudstones and siltstones. In some places, the rocks actually reach a thickness of over 800 metres. So limestone is really interesting as they're composed of the bodies of ancient sea animals. 325 million years ago, when organisms such as corals, crinoids, sea urchins and more died, their skeletons would fall to the ocean floor where their hard parts built up. So hard parts are like the, the skeletons um, and for sea urchins, hard parts would be things like ossicles. Um, they were then compacted into the rocks that we see today. Around 318 million years ago, the limestone was covered by darker sand and mud that later turned into shale and sandstones. These layers reached a thickness of up to 330 metres in the north of County Clare, um, protecting the underlying limestone from erosions for millions of years before being largely stripped away by glaciers during the late Quaternary period. And that began about a million years ago. Glaciers expanded and retreated over the region several times. Finally, let's have a look at the more northerly locations now. So these are the cliffs of Sleeve League. They are 601 metres high and are the highest sea cliffs in Ireland. They're called mega cliffs and mega cliffs are cliffs that have a height exceeding 500 metres. The steep slopes of the cliffs are composed of quartzite. Now quartzite is a metamorphosed sandstone. It's sandstone that's been changed into something much harder through intense pressure and heat uh, when it was buried near to the center of the earth. So quartzite is a very hard rock and it's difficult to erode. The rocks that make up the cliffs are actually much older than the other rocks that we've looked at so far. They're Ediacaran in age, which is when the first animals evolved on Earth. There has been some slumping on the seaward slope, and marine erosion has only played a small part in the shaping of the coastal profile, even though there's exposure to high energy Atlantic waves. And that's probably because the rocks are so hard. The actors also went up to the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. This well-known landscape is composed of an estimated 40,000 basalt columns that resulted from a volcanic ancient activity around 50 to 60 million years ago. In geology, this is actually really recent. The charismatic cracks formed when the lava cooled and contracted, and the size of the columns is dictated by the speed at which that lava cooled. The tops of the column form stepping stones that lead from the cliff to the foot and disappear underneath the sea. Most of the columns are hexagonal, although there are some with four, five, seven or eight sides. The tallest are about 12 metres high and the solidified lava in the cliffs is 28 metres thick in places. Finally, we have Kilcluny Dolmen. This is the location that the body was discovered in. Kilcliny Dolmen is located in County Donegal and was a prominent location during the Neolithic. During this time, the climate was warmer and drier, which meant the land was fertile and capable of supporting farming communities. These communities built tombs and crafted ceramics that are found all over the area today. Geologically speaking, the area is underlain by a large igneous pluton, 
This is basically like a big glob of magma that rises from the Earth's mantle and forces itself into the crust and cools. The emplacement of the Donegal Batholith, so Batholith is basically the fancy name for the glob of cool, cooled magma, uh, so that emplacement happened somewhere between 418 to 397 million years ago and led to the formation of the granite rocks. The portal tomb in question, which is where the body was discovered, is composed of grey granite from the local area with a backstone of red Ardara granite, which may originate around 200 metres south of the tomb. So that covers the locations that could have provided the sediment that we're going to analyse. So it's about time that we looked into the people involved in this case. First up, we have the victim, Mark Hamill, aka Luke Skywalker. From witness statements, we know he visited all of the locations besides Kilcluny Dolmen. Sediment analysis might help us to understand whether or not he went there by himself or whether his body was taken there. Now for the suspects. Let's start off with Daisy Redley, who's playing Luke's Padawan Ray. We know that she worked on Skellig Michael with Mark and took the journey with him, but we don't know which site she visited. This needs corroborating with sediment analysis. Next up, we have John Boyega, who plays Finn. To our knowledge, he was not involved in filming on Skellig Michael, but he did take the trip. We need to work out which locations he visited using sediment analysis. This is Oscar I Isaac, who played Poe. Looking a little bit suave in his picture there, so what's he hiding? Well, we don't think that he was on Skellig Michael, but he did take the trip along the Wild Atlantic Way with the other actors, so we need to look into the sediment to see which locations he went to. And then finally here we have Adam Driver. Now, he was known for playing the bad guy, Kylo Ren, in Star Wars, but he did visit some scenes on Skellig Michael with the victim. He took the trip up the Wild Atlantic Way with the other actors, and sediment samples have been acquired for analysis. Now it's time for us to work together and crack the case. We have all of the background information, and now I'm going to show you the sediment samples that were taken from each suspect. If you're looking at the worksheet, make sure that you follow along and write your notes in the appropriate areas on the, sleep on the sheet. This will help you to organise your thoughts as we work through the exercise. First things first, let's have a look at the sediment samples from each location. These are real microscope images of rocks and some are definitely prettier than others, but they're all informative. If a suspect has been to one of these areas, they will show in the sediment sample. So you can see each of the different sediment samples there from each of the different locations. We'll have a look at them all together in a minute. And these are the sediment samples that were taken from each of the suspects. In a moment, we're going to go through all of these samples together. Are you up for the challenge? Well, with that, let's go live. All right, everybody. Sorry about the uh, the video going to black there, um, but I hope you're still with me. Uh, so we are going to work together to solve this mystery. I hope you've got your worksheet with you, but if you don't, then that's completely fine because we're going to work through this together. Now, I have created a slightly smaller and more interactive version of the evidence board that we were just looking at and hopefully you should be able to see it on your screen now. There we go, yes. So <clears throat> this is the overview of our board and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at sediment samples. So if I zoom in here we can see the six different locations and the sediment samples from each location. So let's take a quick look at Skellig Michael. So here you can see the three 
different samples. This one is kind of like brown, it's got some individual particles, they're all stuck together. And this one, they're grey, they're a lot smaller, um, but you can, you can see that they are definitely individual particles, they're not all kind of fused together. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we need to look for, look for on that one. For location two then, uh, if I just zoom out so you can see the picture again, we've got the cliffs of Moher. Um, and remember what I was saying, that these are made of limestone. So if we zoom in on this one then, we can see, again, we've got lots of individual par uh, particles. They're smaller than what we said were small on the last location, um, but these ones have more grey-brown colour to them. So that's something to be aware of. And here we can actually see a picture of the rocks at the Cliffs of Moher. You can see some really interesting, what we call structures. So this shows us that the sediment wasn't laid down completely flat. We saw that something else was happening there. So let's have a look at the burn now. Oops, I'll try not to move this around too much. There we go. So again, this is made of limestone, but in this one, now I think it's really interesting because I'm actually a paleontologist. So I study dinosaurs and um, extinct organisms and ecosystems. And in this rock, you can actually see some of the extinct organisms. So if we zoom in on this one in particular, all of the, what we call clasts, so clasts are just, uh, it's a fancy name for, for particles of rock, um, they are, <coughs> sorry, they're actually biological. So you can see here, this swirly one, that's what it looks like if you cut like a sm snail shell in half. And some of these other bits, they're from ancient organisms called crinoids. And crinoids were like an ancient sea lily. And actually, some of their relatives still exist today in the Arctic. So every particle in this rock is made of something that was once alive, which is super interesting. And you can see in all of these different rocks, they've got the very, they're very different shaped um particles to them they're not like they don't look like the sand grains that we saw in the last couple so that's something to, to bear in mind so let's zoom back out again and move on to a completely different type of rock when we look at sleeve league so remember what we were saying about the cliffs of sleeve league in the video they're much harder than some of the other rocks that we're looking at and that's because some of them are metamorphic. Now that means that the rock has been changed through temperature and pressure. So you can see here that instead of the particles being kind of separate and fitting in together, they've actually kind of melded together. So they've heated up and they've kind of all mushed together into this one big rock. And that's what makes it so hard because you can't kind of get in between the particles to separate them. They've all kind of merged together. And you can see here that they're a very grey colour. Um, and if you look at this other rock sample here, which is slightly lower down, you can see that some of them, they don't even look like particles at all anymore. They, um, <coughs> they all fit together perfectly. And these different particles or different crystals of rock, as they are now, um, they are much bigger than on the picture above. So we're looking at two different rock types there. So now let's have a look at the Giant's Causeway, which is made of basalt, which is a volcanic rock. Oops, I'll just move that up a little bit so we can zoom in on that properly. So this is really interesting. So the crystals that you can see of this rock, and they are crystals because it's cooled directly from Mangama. It's not been remade uh, with lots of different bits of other rock as sedimentary rocks are. They all, again, they fit together really nicely, but what's really interesting is the shape of some of these crystals. They really stand out, don't they? They're long and thin. And if you look on this image there, which is taken under a different type of light, um, some of them are even blues and greens and reds, uh, which looks much prettier than the picture of the rock, which is taken in normal light. 
So finally then, we will move on to our last location, which is Kilcluny Dolmen. So this rock is granite, which is again a type of uh, igneous rock. So it's come from a cooled uh, magma. But we can see that this type of magma was very different. It's got different things that made it up and as such different crystals have come from it. So you can see that on the what we would call a hand specimen. So this is a, a grump, clump of granite. If you picked it up out of the ground, this is what it would look like. Got lots of white bits, lots of dark bits, and some bits are even shiny. Um, and when we look at it in the version that we would see if we we zoomed in via a microscope, as we're going to do on our sediment samples in a minute, we can see that if we look at it under normal light, some grains are so uh, so plain almost that they're see-through. And you can see some brown there. Now that's probably a mineral that we would call biotite, which is really cool because it's actually shiny. And that's some of the, the shiny stuff that's coming through there. But if we look at it under a different type of light, we can see that actually where it looks see-through, we have got minerals, um, but they are, yeah, they're just very difficult to see under what we would call plain light, plain polarized light that we can see that they're there. So that's what we need to have a look for. Okay, now, now we've had a look at these, uh, at the sediment samples from each of the locations. Let's have a look and see which locations our actors went to. So first, let's have a look at the victim, Luke Skywalker. Now, I'm gonna throw this out to the chat. Are there any samples there that you can match either on your sheet or from the samples that we just looked at, uh, can you match any up? What do you think? Which locations did he visit? I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to type in the chat there. It's quite, uh, quite an interesting one, this one. So if I move that up and zoom in again, you can see some of the spiky rock there some of the rock that's kind of melded together and again up there and this rock looks like it's been put together by lots of different particles so what could they be which locations has he visited okay well we'll just have a look at this one together um so i think that luke has actually visited each location so we can see that this rock here is the same as Skellig Michael, there. And we can see the other sample from Skellig Michael is this one. And we can see that he went to the Cliffs of Moher <coughs> by looking at this sample here. And if we move across a little bit and zoom out, oops, there we go. We can see that he also visited the bone. He was definitely at Sleeve League by looking at this sample there. <coughs> and the Giant's Causeway, as we saw the spiky sample earlier. But finally, did he visit Kilcluny Dolmen? So let's have a zoom in on this one again. So did he visit it on his own? Or was he taken there? That's a definitely a, a good question to, to think about. So we can see again that we've got this lovely picture with lots of different colors and this one with a few fewer colors and if we look back in on the victim there we can see that he did visit Kilcluny Dolman. So maybe that's something to bear in mind as we move through the suspects. Who was at the location that the body was discovered? So let's start off with suspect one who is Ray. So looking at the samples there, can we tell where she's been? Well, this one here, sample number one, we know that she was at Skellig Michael um, because we had it on the police report. So that is definitely Skellig Michael rock there. So it's this one. If we look at this rock, we can see those really spiky crystals again, which is the rock from the uh, giant's causeway. Over here, we can see the third sample. Now, 
remember this one has in the plain light it's got the things that look see-through but then they all appear in the cross polarized light which means that she was at Kilcolini Dolmen which is a little bit suspicious because that's where the body was found. Then when we look at this last sample, sample four, we can match that up. Again, we know that she was with the victim because they've got the same sample there, but that's from the Cliffs of Moher. So we know that Daisy Ridley did visit Kilcloney Dolman, which was where the body was found. So let's move on to suspect two, Finn. So Sample one from Finn is a, that really interesting sample where the crystals all interlock together. So they are from that metamorphic rock that we spoke about earlier. So which location was that? Can we remember? It was Sleeve Week, which is this one. So we're at the metamorphic megacliffs. Okay, and then the next sample here is it's the individual sand grains again so it's probably from Skellig Michael which we can match up there. Our sample three we can see that it's the same as the sample above which is very suspicious because we know that it was from Kilcluny Dolman which is where the body was found and then sample four again if we zoom in we've got all of those interlocking crystals again so we think it was probably a metamorphic rock. So if we zoom back in on Sleeve League here, you can see that, yep, that matches up. And he was from, he went to Sleeve League. So there's two different samples from Sleeve League. There's a sample from Kilcooney Dolman, uh, from Kilcooney Dolman here, sorry, and a sample from Skellig Michael. Okay, let's have a look at our third suspect, Poe. Now, if we zoom in on this picture here, oops, I'll just drag that, there we go, so we can zoom in on that one. We can see it's made up of different particles. They're not kind of melding together like we saw in the other ones, so we're probably looking at sedimentary rock here. And remember what I said about the, the particles looking very different. They don't look like sand grains. So I think they're what's called bioclass. So they used to be living. And I think that this is a type of limestone and it probably came from one of our limestone areas. So let's have a look at those. So we've got the Cliffs of Moa or we have the Burn. Now, if we zoom in here, we can see that this sample matches up here and maybe we just want to bear this one in mind because if we zoom back in on Poe as a suspect we can see that that matches up just there. Okay so which other locations did he visit? We know that he was definitely at the burn so if we have a look at this sample here we can see those fantastic interlocking crystals again so that matches up very nicely with the cliffs of Sleeve League. So he was definitely up in the north with the suspects. And then finally, let's have a look at this last sample. So we can see that it's made up of individual crystals again, of individual particles again, sorry. They're not all interlocking together. They sort of fit together but they're not kind of melded together like we saw in the igneous and the metamorphic examples. So we're probably looking at a sedimentary location again. So if we zoom back in on the cliffs of Moa or Skellig Michael, we might be able to see which one it is. So Skellig Michael, again, we can see some of those um, individual sand grainy type things, but it's not the same as the sample that we saw before. So I think he was at the cliffs of Moa. And I think that matches up quite nicely. So what do you think? Do you think we can rule out Poe as a suspect? He wasn't at the location that the body was discovered. So perhaps he wasn't the person that did it. So finally, we have Kylo Ren, the bad guy in the films. But is he the bad guy for this example? Well, 
if we look at this sample, it's the very characteristic one from Skellig Michael. We can see that quite large individual grains are sort of fit together, but don't meld together. So definitely that sample from Skellig Michael that we can see up there. Next up, let's zoom in on this sample. Again, we can see those very, what we would call angular uh, pieces of sediment. So they've got sharp edges. They, uh, they don't all, <coughs> they're not rounded. They're not like nice sand grains to walk on. They would be quite sharp. So we're looking at, again, one of those sedimentary locations. So if we zoom in, which one do we think it is? Is it the kind of uh, the grey sediment from Skellig Michael or is it the Cliffs of Moa? Well, I think looking at the colours, it's probably this one here from the Cliffs of Moa. And yes, it is because the, <clears throat> the sediment particles are much smaller than they are in this sample. OK, oops, I've lost where we're going. Ah! And I am moving that around as well. That's not very helpful. Okay, so let's have a look at the very last sample then and see whether we can match it up. So we have um, this really nice sample of interlocking crystals. And they're the really long ones that all kind of go in the same direction. Now, where have we seen that before? We've seen it before right here at Sleeve Geek. So with that, let's think about some of the questions that we have. We've answered this one. What type of rock does the sediment on your suspect come from? Whereabouts in Ireland was that rock found? Well, we've matched all of those up. And do the sediment samples match with some found on the victim? Well, all of our sediment samples that we've looked at from the suspects do match with the victim. However, we know that the body was found at Clil Clooney Dolman. So, which of our suspects were at Clil Clooney Dolman? Can you remember? I can see one person saying that they think they know who the murderer is. If you think you know who the murderer is, then perhaps go to uh, your, your keyboard now and put it in the comments. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment while we um, work out who it is, while you all put in your guesses. Yep, there's a, a couple of people putting in their guesses now. So we're going to find out together in a minute whether you are right or wrong. Does anybody else have any guesses? We've got someone saying it was Ray or Finn. Someone there thinking it's Finn, perhaps. Do we have any other guesses at all? You're all doing really well so far and doing really well for, um, yeah, someone thinks it's Ray. So we've got someone thinking it's Ray or Finn, someone thinking it's Finn and someone thinking it's Ray. So who do you think it might be? Any other guesses at all? Oh, someone thinking it's Kylo Ren. Well, perhaps it might be. We're going to find out in just a second if I can get my board to work. There we go. That should work now. Okay. Grand. So more people saying it's Ray or Finn, Ray or Finn, someone saying it's Ray. Excellent people. Well done indeed. So I think let's have a look and see who it was. If I share my screen again, hopefully this should come up. Oh, it seems to be having a bit of a flashy time. So let's get rid of that and hopefully that does that. So we're going to zoom in on the arrest warrant. So oh, we've got we think it's Ray but it might be Kylo Ren. That's a very good, very good thinking. Like you can't just rule out everybody. So let's have a look at these arrest warrants. So we have warrants for the arrest of the perpetrators of the crime. So it wasn't one, but it was actually two killers. It was Ray and Finn working together. 
So what happened? It was actually a collaborative effort. Daisy did the crime, but it was John that conspired to help transport the victim to where the body was discovered. And actually, if we have a look, uh, <clears throat> a look at the rock samples there, you can see that they went to um, the Giant's Causeway and they also went to kill Clooney Dolman. So the police think that it was uh, the murder was done um, using um, rocks from the Giant's Causeway and then the body was actually transported over the border um, and into Kilcluny Dolman. So with that, thank you very, very much for taking part in the exercise today and I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, oh, I've got a comment there from that says, it's Kylo Ren and he's just using a Jedi mind trick. Well, I'm not sure that that is actually the case. I think the police have probably got this one right. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for joining me. And now we can move on to any questions that you might have about geology, geography, uh, even paleontology, that kind of thing, and what it's like to work as a geologist. Yeah, th thanks, Elspeth. That was so cool. I was, I, I was way off. I thought it was Kylo Ren. I, I, I don't know why. Uh, maybe I just suspect him from the movies. But uh, well done to everybody who, especially the people who thought, who, who got that it was two together. That was the twist. There's always a twist, isn't there? Yeah. Um, so yeah, guys, we, before we wrap up, um, uh, Elspeth will take questions from you if you have any geological related questions. And, and there was one earlier on. Um, if we could go back to it, um, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this one, but how was the mountain Sugarloaf created from Jessica Prenton? Yeah, so this is a, a really interesting question. Um, and actually, remember we were talking about um, rocks and how some of them are harder than others. So the Sugarloaf Mountain is actually made of, <coughs> it's made of, I think, some quartzite which is that metamorphose sandstone, um, and it's made of some uh, igneous rocks as well. So igneous rocks are rocks that's cooled from magma. And they're really hard because they have those interlocking crystals that we saw under the microscope images. So what happened was um, a long, long time ago, some magma forced its way up into the crust, kind of like we were talking about for um, the sleeve leaf cliffs. And then uh, what's happened with the sugar loaf is that the surrounding rock was softer than the uh, rock that makes up the sugar loaf mountain. So that's all eroded away. But the harder rock that is the sugar loaf mountain has remained. So that's how it formed. Great. That answers that one. Um, just to go back to the murder mystery, um, we have a, a claim here, and I just fact checked um, Emer Fifi um said that they won and uh, they guessed it first and i went back and yeah they did say it was either ray or, or um or finn so uh, are, are you happy enough to, to congratulate them as the, as the winners or, or is everybody a winner i think everybody's a winner but uh if, if we are doing this in terms of speed then uh yeah <laughs> you would have won okay. well done um we'll go back to the questions there because uh, lorna just asked what made you want to work in geoscience so i'm it's actually a long, a long story um, and one that I hope we've kind of got time to tell because I think it's kind of pertinent to, to people that might be watching in school. So um, a long, long time ago when I was at school, um, I actually wanted to be an astrophysicist, uh, which is a bit different to geology. Um, and I did my A-levels, I'm from the UK, so um, I did A-levels, which are kind of the equivalent of leaving certificate, and I did them in physics, maths, um, and I also did history and geography because I really enjoyed them. And I did my exams, and I did really, really badly in physics and maths, which is what you need to be an astrophysicist. And the reason for this is that I didn't like physics, and I didn't like maths. I just kind of liked the idea that I might be an astrophysicist one day. So I, as you do, I sat down, I had a bit of a cry because it's never good when you don't get the results that you want. Um, and then after a while, I had a chat with my mum and she was like, well, maybe this isn't a bad thing because you don't enjoy doing uh, physics and maths, but what you do really enjoy 
is geography. And I just happened to be looking at this university prospectus and I saw this really interesting course that might be uh, for you. So I had a look and it was a course called Geoscience and I'd never heard of it before. And But it touched upon all of the things in geography that I really enjoyed, which were the physical side of things, like how do landscapes form, and uh, bringing in the, the paleontology aspect, so looking at dinosaurs and ancient extinct ecosystems, which is then what I went on to, uh, to focus on um, later on in life. But this was a real turning point for me because it made me realise that I didn't have to continue down that path that I'd kind of chosen for myself and blindly followed even though it wasn't making me happy I could go and do something that would make me happy and it yeah it, it kind of all all snowballed from there it was at that point that I I went on and applied to do geoscience at university and I had such a a good time doing it <laughs> so yeah that's a, that's a great story it sounds like you were stuck between a rock and a hard place <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so uh, hi, 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 guys in uh, Our Lady of Fatima School in Wexford who just gave themselves a shout out there. Uh, and look, uh, speaking of, you, you said you, you were interested in the kind of rock formations and stuff. There's a question there from Jim about the Cliffs of Moher. Uh, he specifically wants to know where they ever at sea level. So do you want to, I mean, they're one of the, the, the most beautiful and most visited places in, the, in Ireland. Um, so do you want to give us a little bit of background on the Cliffs of Moher? Maybe tell us something we don't know about yeah sure so uh, the clips of Mara are fantastic and i uh, have to give my colleague emma morris um who's actually at the university of utah now um a shout out because she taught me all i know about the clips of Mara. they're really really interesting because they record um an ancient delta system so if you think about the mississippi or the nile today you've got all of that sediment that's being carried along by the rivers and then it's, it has to be uh deposited or, or basically dropped so the energy in the river that's carrying that sediment suddenly drops and all of the sediment kind of falls out because it hits the sea and and slows down it's kind of like going like that into the sea um so basically Yes, <laughs> the cliffs of Moa were at sea level because they were deposited um, by, by this river moving into the sea. But it's really, really interesting because by looking at the cliffs of Moa, we can kind of see how ancient delta systems were working and see how they compare to the delta systems today. So the cliffs of Moa, um, I believe they were old enough that land plants as we know them didn't really exist. So the type of rivers and the type of riverbanks that we know today, so um, for example, if, if you think about, say, the, the Liffey, um, we've got a bank on either side, it's a river, it might meander a bit, wiggle um, and twist and turn, but it's, it's kind of one big thing. It's, it has streams join it, but it, the river is, is one big river. Rivers back then were, closer to what we would call a braided stream. So if you think about rivers from um, that are really high up near glaciers and things like that, that have loads and loads of pebbles, they're not one, one big uh, kind of like thing of water. There are lots of individual streams that kind of crisscross uh, over all of that sediment. So really, it's it's very very interesting because they're different types of rivers than we see today um but yeah it's a very very interesting area and uh emma calls it a living laboratory um because of the the science that you do on it so yeah brilliant thank you very much um look uh on, on that i think we'll wrap up today then Elspeth, um, thank you very much for that. It was uh, it was brilliant. It was really engaging and entertaining and a lot of fun. You rock. <laughs> thank you very much. So yeah, I had to, I couldn't resist, but uh, but also everybody who's watching, you guys all rock as well. Thanks so much for taking part throughout the day. And thank you to all our contributors um, throughout the event as well. Um, it's not over yet. Um, it's over today for the virtual stuff, but here in the Rediscovery Center tomorrow from half 10, until two o'clock, we've got an in-house event 
Um, and anybody who's able to make it, we'd love you to come. There's going to be some hands-on experiments. You're going to learn how magic works. You're going to see a magic show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and um, uh, once again, thanks for joining. We couldn't have done this without everybody taking part and being so engaging and asking so many fantastic questions. It will be available on YouTube to watch after the fact for anybody who missed it. Um, I once again want to thank Science Foundation Ireland for supporting this, Dublin City Council for supporting this. And if anybody, if any teachers are still on the line, uh, don't forget we're offering free workshops all year round to schools through our STEM and sustainability projects. So that's also kindly funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And if you head over to our website, you'll find out more about that and you'll see if uh, your school qualifies. And just to remind everybody, our website is rediscoverycenter.ie. So look at we're at the end of the event, guys. Uh, we'll see you back soon for our next um, event, um, uh, whether we see in person or online. Stay tuned. Keep an eye on our social media pages and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.